great. So, first of all, God, thank you so much again for taking the time out to speak to me today. And can I just start by congratulating you on a really excellent book, which is probably, in my view, the book which is most important for our current times, because it explains so much of what's happening in our world today. And I guess this was the starting point for me, because, you know, we think about this battleground of ideas as being a modern phenomenon. But in reality, so much of our history has been about this battleground of ideas. And it'd be great, perhaps, if you could talk to that and talk about your concept of ideas as pathogens and parasites of the human mind. Sure. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me back on. Am I, dare I be presumptuous enough to say that I'm one of your first repeat guests? Is that possible? I would have, in fact, you are the second only repeat guest. The only other guest I've repeated is Buzz Aldrin. Well, there, well, I'm in, I'm in great company. Uh, so thank you for having me back and thank you for the kind words, uh, Vikas, great to be with you. So uh, it's certainly not the first time in human history that we have faced battle of ideas. You know, human history is laced with endless battles of ideas. I think what is unique to this, to the current zeitgeist is that we are regressing to the dark ages. Usually there is a rhythm to how these things go. We had the scientific uh, revolution, we had the enlightenment, and then all of the downstream positive effects of these two wonderful movements that liberated us from the shackles of religion, that gave us individual dignity, and all of the, the, the rest of the benefits that came with these movements. For the next two, three, four hundred years, uh, we saw nothing but progress, but over the past 30, 40, 50 years, we've had a reversal of that progressive trend yes. by having a bunch of idea pathogens, all of which were spawned within the university ecosystem. As I always say, it takes intellectuals to come up with really stupid ideas. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, these idea pathogens have led us to what I consider to be today the abyss of infinite lunacy. So I can certainly talk about the parasitic concept. Please. Like, yeah. Uh, I'm going to put on my glasses because otherwise I'm going to squint. Apparently, I'm going to get a Yeah. So as an evolutionary psychologist, one of the toolboxes that uh, I use is to engage in what's called comparative psychology. Comparative psychology mm -hmm. is a field where you compare human cognition, human realities to other animals to draw mm -hmm. some parallels, right? So in my looking at the literature, I came across the field of neuroparasitology. So parasitology is the study of how parasites can, you know, uh, infect various types mm -hmm. of hosts. So a tapeworm can infest our intestine, but a yeah. neuroparasite is a parasite that looks for the organism's brain to infest. And there are wonderful cases in, in nature, well, not wonderful to the host, but wonderful examples of neuroparasitic reality. Yeah. So Toxoplasma gondii is one that maybe some of your listeners might be familiar with. If a mouse is infected with this particular brainworm, it loses its innate fears of cats and it becomes sexually attracted to the cat's urine. Mm. Well, that's not a good outcome for a mouse to be attracted yeah. to, a, to, a, to, a, to a cat. Uh, there's also an example of brainworms that aff afflict ungulates, deer, moose, elk. And when they are parasitized by this brainworm, they often will engage in what's called circling behavior. They start going around in a repetitive circle, bobbing their head, unable to extricate themselves yeah. from this motor pattern, even as the looming predators are coming in to eat them, they can't extricate themselves. So I take this idea and I argue that human beings can be certainly parasitized by actual brain worms, but there's another class of pathogens that can infest our, our minds and brains. And I call these idea pathogens, bad yes. ideas that are akin to the Toxoplasma gondii. Wow. And and the, consequ the consequences of this are very real, aren't they? Because, you know, we're, we, we've, we're seeing it in, obviously, the debate that happened last night and the approach of that debate. But every single day we're seeing, you know, um, and I loved how you described, I don't say love, but I think it was an apt description, rather, how you described the death of the West by a thousand cuts, where actually each incidence of these idea parasites being inf infecting a group is causing a slight destruction of an otherwise post-enlightenment world. Exactly. So that was my, the, the first working title of my book was going to be 
death of the West by a thousand cuts. <laughs> but then the idea was that it, it sounded too ominous and you needed something a bit more hopeful. And so then, you know, I pivoted to the current title. Uh, so it's exactly what you said, right? One cut doesn't kill you. Two cuts th doesn't kill you. But once you amalgamate a thousand of these cuts, in this case, the edifice that's being killed is the edifice of reason, the yes. edifice of individual dignity. All of the protective layers of values that have made the West the great societies that, that, that have been spawned in the West are being slowly eradicated by these idea pathogens. And each of these idea pathogens might be operating in different ways, but they all share one common thread, and that is their desire to free the host from the shackles of reality, right? Mm. Uh, and, and that sounds quite uh, extraordinary, but let me perhaps give you some examples. So postmodernism is the granddaddy yes. of all idea pathogens because it liberates us from truth, right? It frees us from this thing called objective truth because postmodernism espouses the idea that everything is subjective. There are no universal truths. Even something as banal as only women bear children within Homo sapiens mm -hmm. becomes a contentious position, as I recount in the book, yes. if you remember. Uh, that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west becomes a contentious position because what do you mean by east and west and what do you mean by the sun? Uh, yes. so, so it is a nihilistic movement. It is what I call intellectual terrorism because it is exactly similar to what happened on 9-11. On 9-11, 19 zealots, that adhere to a particular ideology flew planes onto buildings. Well, postmodernists are intellectual terrorists in that they fly planes of bullshit onto edifices of reason. Yeah. And but how have these ideas been able to, and I'll use the phraseology, but infect civil society? Because, for example, in your book, you talk about the reality of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we see in many ways that these otherwise benign sounding concepts actually, as you said, start to become almost unfightable because any criticism you make, they come back with, well, who are you to define what is or isn't gender? What is or isn't black or white? And it becomes almost impossible for you to break through those ideas. And for most rational people, it seems that we shouldn't have been able to get this far. Yeah, right. Yeah, so I, I think the, the first, the first uh, if you like, opening to these idea pathogens is that they start off with a noble objective, right? Yes. So, for example, the idea that militant feminists reject innate sex differences comes from the laudable goal of eradicating institutional sexism. Yes. But, of course, in the pursuit of laudable social justice, we don't have to murder truth and rape truth, right? I can chew gum and walk at the same time. Regrettably, many of these idea pathogens don't believe in that. They say that they have what's called a tension, and I discuss this in the book, between consequentialist ethics and deontological ethics. Deontological ethics is absolute truth. It is never okay to lie. That's a deontological statement. A consequentialist view of lying would be, well, it's okay to lie if you're trying to protect someone's feelings. So if your spouse asks you, do I look fat in these jeans? If you want to have a long marriage, maybe you need to lie <laughs> to protect your spouse's feelings, right? Yeah. Now, the reality is we all are both consequentialists and deontological in our ethics. The question is, are you applying the right ethical system to the right conditions? Well, when it comes to truth, capital T truth, you should always be deontological. You should never sacrifice truth at the altar of social justice. And that's mm. what all these idea pathogens do. And what was the role, you know, right at the beginning of our discussion, you mentioned that a lot of this emerges on campus. And we've seen that time and time again, that actually within the university environment is where these ideas are sometimes tried and tested and then amplified into society. You know, what, what is it about the campus environment that allows the incubation of these idea pathogens, which then emerge? Well, I think they, they start off in disciplines where there is no direct link between the imbecilic nature of your ideas 
and the mm -hmm. consequences of those ideas. It's no accident that postmodernism didn't arise in the business school and the engineering school because you yeah. can't have fully detached idea pathogen, fully detached from reality if you're trying to model consumer choice or an economic system because there's yeah. a bottom line. If you are perfectly rooted in lunacy, then that model will fail and there is a direct consequence of that. You can't build bridges using postmodernist feminist epistemology physics mm -hmm. because the, the building or the bridge will collapse. So it, it first starts off in disciplines where I could pontificate like a complete imbecile without any consequences to my idiocy. And then of course you've got the authority appeal whereby most students are cowed into silence because the professor is pontificating. Yeah. This is why I tell people in chapter eight of the book, activate your inner honey badger. That doesn't mean that you should be impolite. That doesn't mean that you should be obnoxious. But if people are proposing things that sound wrong to you, then it is perfectly yeah. consistent with a free society to challenge them. So the fact that he or she is your professor doesn't mean that they are immune from criticism and yeah. scrutiny. And as I was reading the book, one thing which I thought which I'd like to ask as a kind of, not as a challenge question, but as a kind of open question is, in many ways, it feels that what we're also seeing is a consequence of changes in our own education system, where if people aren't reading about philosophy and origin of how civilization came to be, if people aren't reading with enough depth on topics and forming their idea narratives of the world by linking social media headlines together, the kind of social justice movements and the kind of, you know, as you called it, the kind of the faux profundity movements actually really link into that. It's almost the consequence of us taking our sense of knowledge and identity from this hyper shortened social media world. Right. Uh, well, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me first discuss the yes. pro profundity end. So in one of the chapters, I discuss why it is that things like postmodernism can, 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 promul can be promulgated successfully on campus. And there I argue that oftentimes what happens is that people use these fast and frugal cues to decide if something is profound or not. So if I'm listening to some postmodernist charlatan up on stage talking all the gibberish, mm -hmm. I can do one of two things. I could attribute the fact that I don't understand the word that he's saying to my being dumb or to the fact that he is espousing complete random BS gibberish. Well, most of us have the humility to attribute my lack of understanding to me being too dumb. It can't be that he is uttering nonsense. It must mm -hmm. be that I'm simply too dumb to understand it. Well, <laughs> yeah. just by using that, yeah. that, that false attribution style, I'm able to get away with a lot of bullshit dispensing, right? Yeah. And by, by the way, my wife, when she first heard me sort of lecture about the, the idiocy of postmodernism, she came to me once and said, you know, thank you so much, Gab, because when I was studying postmodernism in college, I actually thought that I was too dumb to understand it. But now I know that I've been hoodwinked, right? And many yeah. people have written to me to say this, right? So it starts off, now I don't have absolute proof of this, but I do have some telling indices. Uh, there's a quote that I use from John Sear, the famous philosopher in the book, where he's speaking to Michel Foucault, one of the uh, founders of yeah, I call him one of the holy trinity of bullshitters of French postmodernism. Uh, Michel Foucault, yeah. Jacques Lacan, and Jacques Derrida are the, are the three holy guys. Well, Michel, uh, John Seal tells uh, uh, Michel Foucault, how come when I sit down and chat with you, it seems as though I can understand you, but when I try to read your work, I'm completely lost. To which Michel Foucault answers, well, you know, in France, if we don't include all this kind of nonsensical verbiage that nobody will take us seriously. I'm paraphrasing what he's saying. So he is willfully trying to confuse you by appearing, by masquerading as profound when yeah. really saying nothing. So, so wait, sorry, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, so in some ways the only real beneficiaries are, and, and I know it's an odd word, but the grifters, the people who are outputting this faux profundity into more and more and more detailed books about how we need to become lifelong allies and constantly relearn. Exactly. And, you know, I've, I've challenged some people who write to me, prof fellow professors who say, well, you know, it's, you know, you, you make it seem as though everything about postmodernism is, is, is wrong and destructive and as, as, I, as I call it, intellectual terrorism. But no, it has, it has served some value. And then I usually rebut and I say, list me 10 concrete things 
that have come out of postmodernism. So I, if you tell me neuroscience, I could tell you even, and by the way, I don't mean to imply that you can't study the humanities mm -hmm. and the social sciences with, with a commitment to reason. So I'm not just saying either study neurosciences or economics or physics, otherwise the rest is BS, no. But even if you're studying things within the humanities or the social sciences, there is a commitment to reason, to mm -hmm. logic, to some epistemology so that I can grow intellectually. Postmodernism completely turns this upside down, yeah. up is down, left is right, and so on. And, but why are people so susceptible? Because you know, when you were talking in your book about anti-science, anti-reason, you know, th these are movements which, you know, we can argue that actually, you know, at the academic level and the, and the kind of political level, there's, there's certainly discussions to be had. But at a very real civil level, people are now denying vaccines. They're denying climate change. They're making decisions which are actively bad for humanity. So, so why are we as humans so susceptible to this? And actually, are there any things which we as individuals could look out for? as signs of this parasite before it infects us? Well, th there is a malady that I discuss in chapter six, which is sort of a collective malady, which with several instantiations of that malady, I call it ostrich parasitic syndrome. Yes. Uh, you, I use the term ostrich, despite the fact that the ostrich doesn't actually do this, it has become an apt metaphor. The ostrich basically buries its head in the sand so that it can avoid reality, right? It's like, la, 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 I'm not listening to you, right? Parasitic, of course, is for the reasons that we mentioned earlier. So ostrich parasitic syndrome is where you are willfully denying realities that are as clear as the existence of gravity. Now, yes. science denialism, for example, is one instantiation of ostrich parasitic syndrome. But ostrich parasitic syndrome is a greater malady in that it could deny the fact that someone who has a nine inch penis is called a male. Because if he simply calls himself female, he becomes instantaneously female. And if you disagree with that, you're a transphobe. By the way, yes. when I often critique trans activism, this in no way should be conflated with the fact that I am a very strong supporter of trans rights. Every single individual should live free of, dig uh, free of bigotry and with full dignity. But in the pursuit of that social goal, we don't murder truth. We don't Correct. reject the idea that if you're six foot four, 270 pounds and biological male, and you declare yourself to be a woman, now you could compete in athletic competitions yes. against biological females. And if anybody questions that, they are a Nazi transphobe. I don't need to reject reality in order to pursue social justice, right? So anyways, ostrich parasitic syndrome, I, I use one particular way to demonstrate this dreadful malady when it comes, for example, to an honest analysis of Islam, right? Individual Muslims might be lovely or they could be very nasty, just like any other group, right? They are really Correct. nice Jews and they are really mean Jews. But Islam itself is made up of a certain set of codified beliefs yes. in the Quran, in the Hadith, the deeds and the saying of the Prophet Muhammad, and in the Sirah, in the in the biography of Muhammad. And those particular beliefs lead to actual consequences in the real world. So for example, if we have 37,000 plus terror attacks since 9-11 alone in 70 plus countries, each of which those attacks has been linked to the ideology, then you have some highfalutin Western thinker tell you, no, 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 I know that Ahmad Muhammad Hussein said that he did it because of this verse in the Quran, but it's not true. It's because yes. he was beard bullied. It's because he wasn't exposed to enough art in his, in his childhood. It's because of lack of solar panels that's causing climate change, which is causing him to be insane. It's because of lone wolfism. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, I've got a list of 60 or 70 insane reasons that highfalutin Westerners have come up with to explain away these terror acts. Well, I could be perfectly loving and tolerant and uh, respectful of mm -hmm. individual Muslims while being able to tie the dots about <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah. But, but does this also, I mean, on, the, on that religion point, you know, you, you talked about, you know, when, when you talk about in, in your chapter where you talk of diversity, equity and inclusion, you also talked about ideological conformity. And when you mentioned that, one of my reflections was, are we also seeing here one of the symptoms of something being fundamentally missing from our sense of identity? Because rather anecdotally, it does seem 
that societies which have become perhaps more secular or perhaps more devoid of other kind of pillars of, of, of moral reason have become more susceptible to these kind of parasites. Right. So, well, so let me first deal with ideological conformity, Please. and then I'll discuss what I call the die religion, diversity, inclusion, yes. equity. So uh, I, I love the, uh, there's a wonderful analogy. I, I wish it were mine, but it, it, it comes from a neuropsychiatrist who used something called the hygiene hypothesis to, to make the following points. Let me, let me summarize the whole thing because it's very apt to what we're talking about. So the hygiene hypothesis is, an, is a hypothesis from medicine. It's, it's specifically evolutionary medicine that basically says that if you look at, for example, kids who grow up in either sterile environments, sterile in the sense that there are no allergens around, it's very clean, it's very, it looks like an a, a operating room in a hospital, right? You have a mother or father who is OCD in their cleanliness. Children who grow up in these types of allergen-free environments are much more likely to then have respiratory ailments. Whereas children who grow up with allergens, whether because they have pet dander around or they grew up in a farm, they end up having less of these autoimmune diseases. Yes. And the reason for that is because the immune system has evolved to be triggered by these allergens. In other words, for my immune system to work optimally, it needs to be engaged with these allergens for optimal functioning. So now you take this idea and you apply it to sterile echo chambers of ideology, right? If you yes. grow up in an ideological environment where your critical thinking is not activated by, in this case, in this case opposing ideas, so the, the pollutant in this case is someone else having an opposing idea. Well, uh, right. my, brain, my brain and yours have evolved to be activated by opposing idea. That's how I hone my critical thinking. So when we create now universities that are nothing but echo chambers of ideological conformity, you are literally being anti-Darwinian in that you are not feeding yes. our minds with the necessary nourishment to function optimally. So that deals with the uh, ideological conformity. Now, let me mention the diversity, inclusion, and yes. equity. Uh, and please feel free to interrupt me at any point. No, please, I, please go ahead. This is great. So, Thank you. So diversity, inclusion, and equity, again, mm -hmm. starts from a noble place. Hey, some people might not be equal participants in whichever endeavor, and we need to help them achieve better. Well, that sounds nice, but that only sounds nice when we compare the two concepts of equality of outcomes to equality of opportunities. If there is systemic lack of equality of opportunities, if there's systemic racism, for example, or systemic sexism that doesn't allow women or black people to be on campus, well, then of course we have to address that and resolve yes. it. We have, but that shouldn't be conflated with equality of outcomes. Uh, let's take Princeton University's math department. It doesn't have the requisite number of black mathematicians. Aha, it must be due to systemic racism and we yeah. have to fix it. So diversity, inclusion, and equity starts off from a noble cause and it ends up being every single thing that we have fought against, which promotes individual dignity. On university campuses, some of your viewers might be surprised to know that it is no longer the case that professorships are granted based on the merits of your dossier. You are, they're granted based on whether you possess certain immutable traits or not. Well, how does that jive with Dr. King's famous I have a dream idea? It's perfectly antithetical. Critical race theory is, a, is grotesque repackaged Nazism, but it packages itself as fighting against racism. In the pursuit of fighting against racism, it is grotesquely racist, yeah. whereby you're, you're asking people who have a particular skin you, in this case white, to go to seminars where they have to self-flagellate and apologize yeah. for being white for things that other people committed 300 years ago that has nothing to do with them. How is that laudable? How is that classically liberal? It isn't, but yet it is cloaked in the robe of social justice. It's grotesque. Wow. And I think, you know, it's, it's so true. You know, I've been, you know, in several of the businesses that I'm involved in, you know, we've, we've had members of the staff saying, you know, we have to say something about BLM, for example. I'm like, well, you know, 3,000 miles that way, I, I don't know, what, what, what are we going to say? You know, it's, it's one of those things. There's almost a sense now of obligation where the movements, the movements that we're discussing here, the kind of social justice movements have become so powerful 
that for corporations now, it's almost, and businesses and for the wider society, it's almost makes you a pariah should you not say exactly what you are told to say when you're told to say it. Exactly. And th this is what I call, I have a section in my book that I, I, I call all roads lead to bigotry, right? If you, so to speak along the lines of what you're saying, if I say, for example, that I am particularly attracted to black women because I find them exotic and beautiful. Well, then I am a rabid uh, racist because I am objectifying the black body. Mm -hmm. If I say I am not attracted to black women because I prefer <laughs> yeah. Asian women, yeah. then I am engaging in sexual racism. So, so think of what that means. If I'm attracted to black women, I'm racist. If I'm not attracted to women, I'm racist. Well, Karl Popper, the famous philosopher of science argued that for a, a theory to be scientific, it has to pass the falsification principle. In other words, there needs to be a way for me to be able to falsify the theory. If I can't falsify, if, if there's no data that could ever falsify the theory, it doesn't fall within the realm of the epistemology of science. Well, these types of social justice movements are anti-science in that you can't be, it can't be falsified. Let me, let me give you one yes. other example, right? If, so there's, I'll give you two quick stories from the book. A woman from Queen's University in Canada decided to don the hijab to, and she wore it, I think, for 18 days because yeah. she wanted to demonstrate how rapidly Islamophobic Canadians were. At the end of the 18-day experiment, she found out, to her dismay, that Canadians were incredibly kind, sweet, and polite to her. So did that cause her to revise her a priori hypothesis? No, she concluded that they were so nice to her precisely because they were so Islamophobic. If they didn't have, that's right, but that's right, sir. It's because they were so latently inside, hidden, latent uh, Islamophobia that they had to overcompensate by being kind to her. Therefore, there was no way that Canadians could be freed from the downstream appellation of being rabid Islamophobes. One other example that is even more astonishing than this one. So a Israeli doctoral student, a Jewish Israeli doctoral student, uh, you know, who's very much into the self-flagellation, yeah. decides as part of her at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, she wants to do a, whatever, some doctoral paper on uh, demonstrating that the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, mm -hmm engages in rampant systemic rape of Palestinian women. So she goes down her empirical journey and to her dismay, she finds out that there are no cases of rape of Palestinian women. So did she then conclude, my God, these IDF soldiers are truly moral in that they are not exploiting their position? Absolutely not. They are so hateful of Palestinian women. They are so othering those women that they weren't even worthy of rape. So yeah. to not rape women yeah. becomes an act of hatred. That's wow. what universities teach. Wow. And what can we do about this? Because, you know, we, we are, we're in a situation, we, we we're in a position now where, you know, even for example, the United States and the United Kingdom, which ostensibly have been the bastion of common sense and reason for such a long time, are now in a position where it's rather worrying. And, you know, what can we do as a society, as individuals to move forward? You know, how can we actually fight some of these forces and return to a place of reason and of truth? Yes. So several ways to answer this. First, I'll give some quick ways, then a much sort of broader answer. <laughs> yeah. So I argue in, in the last chapter where I have sort of a call to action, I provide sort of several call to action. So Activate your inner honey badger. Now, the reason why, for those of you who don't understand that particular metaphor, uh, a honey badger is extraordinarily fierce. So a honey badger is the size of a small dog, and yet you can go on YouTube and see one honey badger holding at bay six adult lions, right? So the lions are so intimidated by the ferocity of the honey badger when he is bothered that they say, you know, I don't want to be a part of it. Well, yeah. When I say activate your inner honey badger, what I mean by that is if you have certain first principles that you truly believe in and that you can clearly enunciate why you believe in them, be a honey badger. Don't be cowed into silence. 
Don't not speak because you might lose friends. Guess what? If someone is not good enough of a friend to be able to accept that you might have a different opinion, then, then your, your friendship is not anti-fragile. And you know what? I don't want to be surrounded by such yes. friends. Right? So I, I discussed several of these strategies in chapter eight, but in chapter seven, I have a, a, a bigger, if you'd like, epistemological tool that we can use when seeking truth. Should I discuss that maybe? Could yes, that be please. Good? That would be okay, great. So, so that, that, forgive me because it's going to require a bit of a setup. So No, that's completely fine. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, let me draw, let me go back to a fellow Brit uh, Charles Darwin, who, by the way, some wish to now cancel because of whatever reason. Yes. Uh, so Charles Darwin, when he uh, developed his theory of evolution, eventually written in 1859 on the origin of species, what he did is he assiduously collected data over several decades stemming from many disciplines, from geology, from paleontology, from animal husbandry, from uh, ecology so that all of uh, from biodiversity so all of these different lines of evidence were then put together to offer what seems like unassailable and insurmountable amount of evidence which for yeah. 150 years people have tried to falsify and they haven't been able to because he is exactly correct now take that that very assiduous methodology and let's put it into the current context so i argue that in the same way that Darwin built this tsunami of evidence, whenever we are arguing for a position, we can use the tool that I call nomological networks of cumulative evidence. So for example, so I'll first uh, give a concrete example and then yeah. I'll... The, the, so Please. let's suppose I want to prove to you that toy preferences are not socially constructed. So the, the usual argument from social scientists is uh, mommy and daddy are sexist pigs they will teach little Vikas to play with the, 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 the gun and the, the toy, you know, the whatever, yeah. the G.I. Joe, and they will teach little Linda to play gently with the uh, pink Barbie, and that starts a cascade of gender role socialization, but it's all arbitrary sexism. So if I wanted to prove to you that no, there are actually hormonal and biological signatures that explain the sex specificity of toy preferences. How would I go about doing that? So now I'm gonna put on my hat of what would be all the distinct lines of evidence that I would have to amalgamate for you to convince you of my position. Now, I won't do the whole homological mm -hmm. network, but I'll give you three or four lines of evidence that Please. are very convincing. So I could, for example, take children who are in the pre-socialization stage of their cognitive development, meaning by definition, they couldn't have been socialized. They haven't reached that age yet. And I can show you that little boys and little girls will already exhibit those sex-specific mm. preferences by which toy they tend towards, which one do they look at first, which one do they interact with, with more. So already that line of evidence is putting a nail in the coffin of the social constructivist argument. But of course, if I want to build a good nomological network, I need to be much more brutal in my ability to convince you. What if I take data from other animals? What if I brought vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees who are infants and showed you that they exhibit the same sex specificity of toy preferences? Yeah. Well, now it's making your position that it's all due to social construction look pretty silly. I'll just do one more, but you could imagine how yeah, yeah. you feel. What if I took children or little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is an endocrinological disorder that masculinizes their morphology, that masculinizes their behaviors. So little girls who suffer from this endocrinological disorder have toy preferences that are exactly reversed, that are similar to boys. Wow. So now I've gotten you data from pediatric endocrinology, from comparative zoology across many species, from developmental psychology, all of which are pretty unassailable. Now imagine if I added another seven or eight <laughs> lines of evidence, now yeah. you're starting to look like a fool. So the reality is when we are seeking truth, we can't be cognitive misers. We have to do the hard work. So for example, if you Vikas were to ask me, what's your position on the legalization of marijuana? Well, I have the epistemic humility to say, you know what? I don't know enough about this topic. I can't build you a nomological network to absolutely prove my position. Therefore, I'll refrain from making a comment. 
So there is no way to seek truth without being discommitted to yes. building the right epistemology. Wow. And I think, um, God, that's one of the most important things which I think everyone can take from your book is that which is, after reading it, I think it will equip everyone with the mindset and the tools to actually start to query the world and query conversations and actually start to formulate their own ways of hunting out the information that they need to really understand what is the true position. And for that, I thank you. And, you know, I thank you so much for the time you've taken out of your day to day to speak with me. And I'm very much looking forward to putting this piece live. Thank you so much. And continue right. your great work on your platform. It's really amazing the number of people you brought on. Keep up with the good work.